There are two new roses on the market just right for growing in Northland conditions. We'll meet their makers on this edition of Great Gardening straight ahead. It really is a special environment. I love the organization of the petals. It's a Campanula, Campanula conglomerata. Hummingbirds will go there, the bees are all over the place. Urban gardening is a wonderful thing. Hello, welcome back to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. It takes time, hard work, and dedication to introduce a newly created flower. We'll talk with the breeders of two new hardy shrub roses in just a bit. But first, I want to introduce again two very hardworking garden experts here Bob Olin, horticulturist and educator, and Tom Casper, owner of Bending Birch's Greenhouses. And you guys, yeah, you've been at it for, for many, many, Many years. <laughs> yeah, we're not, not going to add those years up. <laughs> but How we're long? Ta we're, we're talking about people who, you know, really devote um, so many years to what they do, and I know you guys have done that as well. And how are you enjoying the weather today? Fantastic. Fantastic. You know, we've day. been waiting, what, six months for this? Yeah. Something like that. Maybe yeah. seven this year. So it's beautiful. We're off and running. Yes. Uh, things are drying out. And we're getting started with a great season. Yeah, it sounds oh. like a nice weekend coming up, too. Excellent. Um, and the greenhouses are open. Greenhouses are open and you know, people want to get out there. It's been a little slow because it's been cold, but pick out the varieties that you want and uh, you may want to hold some things, mm -hmm. particularly frost sensitive, but you might want to shop early and then you can always shop again, right, Don? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but just so you get the selection and the varieties, uh, this far north variety selection is a very important uh, factor. So get what you really want and okay. then you can backfill later. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> well, our phone volunteers this week are from the Duluth Garden Flower Society, Mount Royal Garden Club. They're here to take your calls with garden questions for Bob and Tom. The number is 218-788-2844. That's the local number. We have a toll-free number for you as well up on the screen there. Or you can email askgardening at wdsc.org. And we have some pictures of signs of the season. Here they are, um, shot just this afternoon. There's a forsythia and uh, lots of things budding and blooming, including our uh, favorite, favorite, favorite flower, <laughs> favorite the dandelion. Flower, the dandelion. <laughs> yeah. Box elder. It's really a box elder, that is. OK, all right. Well, yes, greening up out there, budding, leafing out, it just Summer will be here before we know it, right? Yes. All right. Well, last month at a um, special presentation at the annual garden event in St. Louis County, Julie Overham received recognition for her years of work as a rose hybridizer. It's no small task for an independent breeder to see a new rose commercially released. It takes at least a half dozen years of company testing and trials and Julie worked for more than 20 years at her own greenhouse, hybridizing roses in Lake Nebagamon. We have one of the plants right here. Bob brought in one of Julie's roses, the cherry frost that uh, she brought to the market. And, and what a wonderful rose it really looks to be. It, it really is. And of course, this year is a pre-release, so they're kind of hard to find. So mm -hmm. I don't want to get hijacked on the way back to my truck. <laughs> <laughs> Pam and I are going to jump in. <laughs> but nice looking plant. Congratulations, Julie, if you're right. watching. Uh, we got one of your new introductions. Cherry Frost, just love it. All right. Yeah. And now here's more about the new rose. The rose is named Cherry Frost, and it is um, suitable for growth in this area. It will, depending on the year, you may find that it dies back to four inches, or it may be not have any damage at all. Um, so it is repeat blooming. It is a um, double red, which means it has uh, around 20 to 25 petals, roughly. Uh, non-fading red because a lot of the reds are kind of pinky and they can fade as the sun hits them. This one really retains its color really well. Uh, huge clusters of blooms. 
I'm not going to say it's perfect, you know, under the right circumstances, any rose can get diseased, but in general, it was developed without any use of sprays or no fungicides, no pesticides, nothing. Um, my rose had to, to be good enough to survive without anybody having to spray it. It will come out next year. Uh, there's there's one, one place in Minnesota that is selling it this year that got it for pre-release. Um, I, I, I'm in a catalog. There it is, the cherry frost. Wisconsin breeder. So you're going down in history. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> From the perspective of what I've worked at, you know, it's like, oh, I made it. I'm in a catalog, you know. So this is just the next step. Next year it will be on the market then people have to want to buy it. And so there's no guarantees that um, it's going to be a success, but to have gotten, spent 22 years to get to this point, I at least feel like I never quit and I, you know, I, I met my goal. It's a thrill, it is a total thrill. Again, the Cherry Frost Shrub Rose, and uh, we hope it's a great success and yeah. that lots of people enjoy planting it and enjoying it for years. We will be, and you know, her story is so inspirational. Uh -huh. She left a career and she spent, did spend 22 years of really dedicated selection. And she told me about five years ago that she wanted one thing in her life, and that was one rose introduction. So she's got that. Congratulations, Julie. She reached Julie. that goal. We're looking forward to the next several from here on in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have some questions and a couple of them, as you guys know, came in last week and um, they were about the um, whether or not it was safe to plant vegetables and other plants after the oil refinery fallout. That was Sue from Superior and then also Don from Duluth was concerned about the pollution from the fire. and. Um, You've been looking at that and some of the recent reports that are coming out. So let's just talk about that briefly. Yeah, we held off answering that question because we really wanted to wait until we had uh, a response from the, the officials who were actually looking at that, including the uh, Douglas County Health Department. We did receive a release specifically about gardening. And once again, there, there's, of course, health issues re related to the smoke plume, but the deposition after that uh, doesn't seem to be much of a concern. Um, there's always been a certain amount of um, material that's come from any kind of combustion, whether it be a forest fire or driving your automobile. And they, with the EPA and uh, Husky Energy's consultants, have been out and looking for areas where there might be a, a fair amount of soot being deposited. And at this point, uh, they're not overly alarmed. Now, that being said, you should take good precautions for everyone, even if you weren't in that area. Um, soil, uh, you want to keep that off your hands or wash it when you're done working in the, um, in the garden. And certainly any of the root crops that might have some soil attached to them, uh, you want to peel those off. And then everything just in general should be uh, washed and, and kept clean and sanitary. You know, if, if I might just say, uh, young children are always have a tendency, you know, between one and three to actually mm -hmm. explore and eat soil. Sure. So particularly in urban areas. And some of us older people. <laughs> <laughs> We're get really hungry yeah. at the end of the day. Basically not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea, and I think that that we want to be really cautious of, particularly uh -huh. in urban areas uh, where there may be other contaminants like lead and other things. So this yeah. has allowed us to talk a little bit about that. Don't worry about gardening, but uh, make sure you're careful of contact with the soil. Mm -hmm. and, and like Bob said, just good cleanup or good yeah. cleaning of those, uh, that produce that you're getting out of the garden. We don't want to discourage anybody from gardening, mm -hmm. so just good cleanup should be fine. All right, all right, thanks a lot for addressing that. We appreciate it. Um, Nancy from Hayward has arborvitaes that have brown spots on the sides of the tree. Uh, wondering if that's from the sun or could the arborvitae be dying? Um, hard to see without pictures of yeah. it, what those look like. There's a couple of uh, problems that happen with arborvitaes, but uh, also um, with, with a couple disease issues. But more than likely, it could be just a little bit of damage from the winter. It could be some, some uh, animal damage, things like that. Take, keep a good eye on it if she wants to go in and fertilize this spring. A lot of times they will grow out of those, so. Okay. Um, AJ from Eveleth, how soon can she fertilize an established perennial flower bed? Oh, perennial flowers, I think as long as they've broken bud and the, uh, it's not too moist 
and the frost is obviously out of the ground, I think now it'd be just fine. You want to wait in, until the plant is actively growing, and at that point you can you can supply some fertilizer. And, and really, it, yeah, as, as they're just starting to grow is a great time to do that because she can get in, uh, sprinkle that uh, fertilizer around the base of those plants, cultivate it in without having it come in contact with that newly emerging foliage that it can burn or things like that. So just a little sprinkle around through the garden, cultivate it in, and they'll love you for it. But okay. Don't be overly concerned if you're a little late on that because a lot of the nitrogens have to make this conversion to nitrate that the plant can use, and that incurs, occurs when soil temperatures are warmer. So um, even for a few of those things, if we go another week or two, the plant's still going to be able to take advantage of the fertility. Excellent. Okay, Mary from Duluth is wondering about an environmentally friendly way to rid weeds from the lawn. <laughs> you got it? Yeah. <laughs> Pulling, right? Well, Pulling and, 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 <laughs> well, well and, it, and it becomes a level of tolerance, too. Sure. It, if, you know, if, if we don't see th those as weeds in our lawn, just a part of our lawn, um, then there's a greater tolerance. So. But certainly pulling them, uh, also doing, taking care of the health of that lawn, so keeping it fertilized will encourage the grass to grow and will in, very aggressively and actually choke out some of those weeds over time. And so. those are good points. The other thing is we saw those beautiful dandelion flowers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you want to minimize the seed pressure, you've got to get those cut. So cutting sure. off anything that's in bloom would be, it would be beneficial. Before it seeds, right? Okay. Well, um, we're going to talk now about another rose breeder who was at last month's spring conference and is a noted Wisconsin horticulturist who talked with us about his hardy shrub rose introduced just a few years ago. I started breeding roses when I was a kid and had a wonderful mentor. Um, Elton Strack, so he was like a grandfather to me, and, and Elton had these large species hybrids that um, had some wild roses in them, wild rose species, and uh, they didn't rebloom as much, but they were hardy, they were big, and that's what inspired me to re redirect uh, my breeding to things that are more adapted, and above and beyond uh, has one of the wild roses he collected in eastern Canada as its grandparent. And, it's, it's a large growing um, ro rose that's healthy and, and hardy. Could be used as a climber. Orange buds with apricot, um, soft yellow blooms as they open. So, so it's, a, it's a unique rose for the color combined with disease resistance and hardiness. And another really dedicated hybridizer. And of course we saw um, Dr. Zlezak previously when he talked about the nine bark he had introduced. But um, Tom, you said you've grown one of the above yeah, and beyond but, roses. But it's a beautiful climbing rose, very, very hardy. And if folks are looking for something different than William Baffin, which a lot of folks have and is also very hardy, they can look for above and beyond. It's got those beautiful apricot colored mm, flowers yeah, that just gorgeous. blooms all season. So. And both Julie and Dr. Zlezak have worked together as companions and they're both trying to introduce roses that really uh, resist a lot of disease, so there's no need for pesticides that are very winter hardy. Uh, so they're really moving in the right direction with their breeding work. Mm -hmm. And that's a concern for everybody, um, as, as we saw from the last question, and here's another one, um, not necessarily about plants, but are there any sprays to control mosquitoes that aren't harmful to bugs and butterflies? And, and I guess it is about plants because we, want, we worry about the bugs and the butterflies and the pollinators and yet we don't want those darn mosquitoes around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, you know, you gotta work with someone that's really worked with those materials mm -hmm. and then be very, very careful. It's the homeowner that might be making an application. Uh, we're very concerned about pollinators, butterflies and other pollinators, and uh, they're gonna be out and active with their flowers where there's full sun during the day. So if there is applications being made, you really wanna be in overcast days or in the evening when the pollinators aren't gonna be available. And then just being very careful that you mm -hmm. uh, don't direct any materials toward anything that's flowering. Mm -hmm. okay. And certainly things with citronella have shown uh, yeah. positive help. It doesn't control mosquitoes, but it may, if you're out on your patio, help you mm -hmm. be out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Okay, all right. Um, Jim from Duluth has an Alberta spruce that has developed spruce bud worm. What should he do about that? And what is 
Maybe you could describe that for us. Well, the... Or do you know what it is? Oh, yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's a little bit of a misnomer because spruce budworm actually attacks balsam in the area more than it does spruce. Oh, really? And actually, this is a situation where it'd be really helpful if we took a took a careful look at it because the uh, the actual worm or the larvae that does the damage will attack just as the buds are beginning to unfold. And if you're seeing evidence this year, the attack occurred last year. So he really wants to observe them. Uh, there are some materials like safer insecticidal soap, but that, that larvae, when it's out and present in feeding, has to be controlled. And there are some quote unquote organic uh, pesticides that could be used for control, but that's not until bud break. We're, we're probably okay. three, four weeks away from that. Mm -hmm. All right, Doris's rhododendrons were eaten by the deer. She has no buds. But the stalks are healthy, so i uh, wondering should I cut them back or just leave the stalks? Um, probably not a good thing, uh, depending on how much damage those deer have done to rhododendrons. All of their, or most of their growth is from those tips. So if she's lost all the buds, chances are the, the plant is not going to survive. And so just, so cut it or leave it or? Or replace it. Replace mm -hmm. it, oh, or, okay. Or prune at ground level as well. Yeah. Ground level, <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, unfortunately, they, uh, when deer do that kind of damage, it's almost time to replace it. All right. So. And you really have to be very conscious with all the azaleas, all the rhododendrons. Uh, the first thing, good plant selection and then deer controls, the first thing really has to be in your mind. Okay. Uh, Marie from Duluth wonders, should she prune her hardy hibiscus or let it go? Um, certainly can prune it. Uh, now would be a great time to do that just before probably hasn't broke bud yet. She can go in and prune it. It isn't gonna affect its ability to bloom this summer because all of that comes off new wood, so. Cool, and uh, speaking of which, uh, for this week's tour, we return to the Lake Superior South Shore where pink and hibiscus uh, are the preferred color for flowers and pink is also the preferred color for the surrounding hardscape. Welcome to our garden. We're so thrilled for you to be here. My name is Pam Smiley and this is my husband, John. And we're in Washburn, Wisconsin on the banks of Lake Superior. That's where the idea began, just inviting people to share the lake. The first time I saw a hibiscus, I love this, the organization of the petals because it's like a fan going all the way around. I saw these at the greenhouse in winter and um, bought some thinking, we'll see, and was immediately hooked. And they, not only did they grow, they bloomed, but they thrive. This is only the fourth year I've had them. Um, I'm guessing I have about 30. So I took six plants and I sawed them in half and um, planted them up there. And that's my incubator area up there. And they all came up in the spring. And the other thing about hibiscus, some of them have that burgundy leaf. Mm. This is new this year. Just a intense mauve or plum. Basically the colors are all in the pink family and red. This is my favorite. I just, I think she's so pretty. I got the weeping larches that are, I like them heading up entries because they look so gracious. It's like they're bending and greeting. They're bowing down. Yes. So when we built the new home, the elevation was probably about three feet higher than this home and we needed to make a transition. And uh, so we transitioned and then uh, put this bed in here of, of rock so that when the water does come, a lot of it evaporates off the rock. It's uh, pink granite, pink and black granite from Highbridge, Wisconsin. Probably have brought in 60, 70 tons of that. It's milkshake. Um, I knew our grandkids would like the name milkshake, I thought. They're really quite large, or coneflowers. When you stand here in amongst the bee balm, there are more hummingbirds flying around you than you can count. What do you do when you have three pieces of beautiful curved iron? And this is what came up. A lot of flocks, and then the hydrangea. Um, I like to let things run into each other 
I like it, to me it lo looks like a bouquet in the garden. I think that I'm just blessed with a really kind growing area. Again, Pam loves the color pink in her gardens, but there was so much beyond that to enjoy and admire and uh, with, with the pink granite, wow. and it's just a gorgeous landscape, really. Yeah. What a spectacular garden that we visited on the uh, tour to Bayfield That's right. last year. Just spectacular, right, um, yeah. and right on Lake Superior. So. You yep. know, oftentimes people say, oh, I've got so much heavy red clay, or the, it's, the weather is so inclement that I can't do a beautiful job. Yet just, we see tremendous examples really everywhere, but here what people might consider difficult growing conditions, they've done a beautiful job. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, how about some more questions? Um, Patty from Duluth says, my snow on the mountain has crept into my peonies. Are they compatible since I can't keep control of the snow on the mountain? <laughs> um, yeah, the peonies probably aren't going to mind that very much, but certainly getting it out of there is going to help the health of the peony, just like any of our plants, if they're competing against other things, is going to take away from our ability to enjoy them. So if she can get in to get it out, um, it's going to be better for the plant. So. The nice thing is snow on the mountain is invasive, but it's not aggressive, if you can figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I mean, sure, it, but... <laughs> it, it does spread like crazy, but it doesn't have a real destructive, uh, oh, okay. aggressive root system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. she can get in there and she can still work that out. Mm -hmm. All right, Mary from Cloquet says, how do I keep grass from growing among my rose bushes and other plants? Now, there's an aggressive plant. <laughs> 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 if you take a look at a crack grape, uh, quack grass. Quack grass, <laughs> help me. <laughs> and uh, any what we call rhizomatous grasses, it's like a Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, they do have these uh, very aggressive rhizomes that want to push in. So my advice there would be to try to keep it out before it gets there. So you want a, a, a real good border. If people are going to put borders, don't buy an inexpensive plastic border. It gets something that will drop down at least six to eight inches and keep those rhizomes out of the garden to begin with. Once they're in, she's going to have to either selectively take it out with some kind of an herbicide where she has to be extremely careful, or she's going to have to get in there and dig it and pull it. And it, it, it does become a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Therese from Duluth wants to know, can I leave tree trunk guards on all year, or should they come off for the summer? They should come off. Okay. All right. Place for fungus and insects and all sorts of things. So sure. She should remove them every summer, then put them back on in the fall. Okay. Good to know. All right. Jim, north of Virginia, when's the best time to graft apple trees? Well, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to bench graft them, uh, the key is really when you're going to get your cyan material. You're going to start with dormant rootstock, and you're going to pull cyan material off while it's dormant in maybe February or March. So really, you're looking at the grafting process in mid-March, and then it acclimates, it gets refrigerated again, and then it gets rooted up later. So I would say. Uh, between February and mid-March is the, is the time when you're going to be grafting. Okay. But not planning necessarily, but you're going to get them grafted at that sure. time. Sure. Okay. And Dave from Spooner has a forsythia about 30 years old. The leaves turned brown but didn't drop. Um, it is budding but doesn't look like it will flower. It probably will, won't it? Um, hard to say, yeah. you know, depending on the variety, although sure. it sounds like it survived for 30 years. But forsythia is one of those that is very affected by cold temperatures, those flower mm -hmm. buds. So depending on where it's located at, uh, those buds could have been damaged. Although we just saw in the signs of the season <coughs> that Ted had shot that the forsythia are in bloom in Duluth right, right. now. So. And I saw one today that you know had the brown leaves on, but the buds were coming out on, mm -hmm. underneath it and the flowers yeah. were opening. And I think that was a bit of a part of what happened last year with that cold in October, sure. that really cold. Uh, that seemed like it froze a lot of leaves right oh. or damaged them and they did not fall from the, the shrubs or the trees. So. Okay, um, we want to hear from an area horticulturist who has been planting some cultivars not usually found here and he finds they can fr thrive in these parts. A unique selection of cold hardy plants and shrubs come to us from Mike and Louise Heim in Hayward. 
they grow hardy mountain laurels that bloom beautifully in pinks and purples. Mike says these cultivars came from a region of the Appalachian Mountains. He also successfully grows this mountain pepper bush, or Cleithra, which came from the Appalachians as well. It has grown hale and hardy in his Hayward landscape for some 30 years, where in early spring, before it buds, the bark of the pepper bush exfoliates. The Himes also have found success with this Shortia hybrid, commonly called Okani Bells. It's an evergreen perennial from the Carolinas that blooms with dainty pink early spring flowers. If you have pictures of plants and flowers to share, unique or common ones, we love them all, send your large format photos to greatgardening at wdse.org and let us show what you grow. And it's always fun to see things from other areas brought in that uh, do really well here. Well, as always, go to our website for more information on Northern Gardening events and past episodes of the show. But that's going to do it for this edition. Uh, we want to say thanks to our phone volunteers from the Mount Royal Garden Club. Bob, Tom, wonderful job as always with all of those questions from all over the area. We really appreciate your time and expertise. And from all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.